also have the privilege of introducing the speaker. So as you know, PJ is on sabbatical um, for the next several weeks, a uh, month. And we have tonight, today we have Chad Erlen, uh, Erlenborn, who's a senior advisor at uh, World Vision. Really, he's a, he's, a, he's a great person. He's friends with PJ. PJ's on sabbatical, and we're just really thankful that he just stepped up and said, you know, I'd love to come here and, and to speak uh, the message. So, Chad uh, Erlenborn, oh, there he is. <laughs> While we're waiting, there's a funny story he told me. Uh, he's, a, he's a hockey player, and so I guess uh, he got in a fight. Hopefully, uh, maybe that was before you were a Christian, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I still got a little um, scars from that, but uh, it is delightful to be here. I am so grateful for this time of worship. I love your worship. I love this church, and I'm with World Vision. We have a partnership in the gospel. Raise your hand if you've done anything with World Vision. You walk for water, you sponsor a child, you've prayed, you've given. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for what you have done. You are changing the world. You know, uh, Pastor Jeff and Jared and I had a chance to go to Ecuador not that long ago. And uh, we were at a choosing party. I don't know if you got the photo up there. There we are. That's uh, Pastor Jeff, and there's a child that has chosen one of you. And then after the choosing party, we went up to the hills a little bit, and we saw this alpaca group. Oh, that's me. I got a little excited there when I saw that alpaca. But right before that, you got the rest of the group there, and, and uh, Jared's there. And there was just this great work where we're caring for the creation, providing jobs, providing clean water to kids. It's transforming the community because of you, because of your faithfulness, because of your participation. God is doing a beautiful work. Children are drinking clean water. People are coming to faith in Jesus. Parents are getting jobs because of our partnership in the gospel for the most vulnerable children. So thank you. So I, I served as a pastor. Yeah, you can give it up for that. You can give it up for that. So I, I'm, I'm married. Uh, I got four children. Um, they're all grown. We're getting there. Uh, my, my youngest is about to head off to college. And uh, I've served as a pastor for a handful of years and, and now, have, um, now with World Vision. But um, I love your pastor. And I'm just wondering if we could just give a round of applause to your pastor. He is worthy of double honor. He's worthy of triple honor. I mean, he is a man after God's own heart. He's a faithful leader, and I'm delighted to call him a friend and uh, thankful for the opportunity to come and share with you today. And I thought that I would start our time together uh, with a question, and it's a bit of a direct question and maybe even a bit offensive, but my question for you today is this, have you ever lied? Have you ever lied to your boss, to a friend, to your spouse, to a teacher, to a parent, to the person sitting next to you? Have you ever lied? Just quick show of hands if you've lied ever in your life. Okay, the rest of you, you're all a bunch of liars. I mean, we know. <laughs> we know that all of us at some point in our lives, we've not told the truth. That we have lied, and, and, and I have lied, and sometimes I still do. Like when someone comes up and asks me, how you doing? And I know I'm not doing very well, but I say, okay. I'm fine. Or when I'm running late, and I get that call, you know, when are you going to be there? And really, I'm going to be there in 20 minutes. Or, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Or, or why are you late? Well, you know, the traffic, but I'm still brushing my teeth because I woke up late, right? And I make up these little excuses in my head to try to look good. And, and sometimes I tell half-truths or sometimes I exaggerate. But one of my most memorable lies came when I was in high school. And uh, I was taking auto shop class from Mr. Bondus. And I don't know what it was with Mr. Bonus, but he and I, uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't connect well, and I was failing auto shop. And I know what you're thinking, and now I'm going to teach you the scriptures, and you're, and, and, and you're wondering how that could happen. Well, it gets worse, right? I'm failing auto shop, and I need to pass auto shop so that I can get, you know, I need to pass the final so I can pass auto shop so I can stay playing hockey for my, my high school. I grew up in Wisconsin. I live in Ventura County now. And uh, I'm, I'm in, um, I'm needing extra help. So I go down to Mr. Bondus's classroom to get help for the final so I can pass it. Knock on the door, and the door swings open. And I walk in and say, hey, Mr. Bondus, no one's there. 
So I walk over to his desk and I see the final exam. And I took it. I know. And I put it in my back pocket, my, my, behind my pants. And I start walking out of the classroom. And then, boom, there's Mr. Bondus. And he says, what are you doing? I said, I, I was just looking for you. And he says, what do you've got behind you? And I said, nothing. He said, let me see. So I had to turn around. And then he pulls out the final exam. And he says, have a seat. I'm going to call the principal. While the principal is coming down, i got to think of a story. And I, I remember one of the kids, one of my classmates was talking about keys that were opening up classrooms. So I came up with this story that, yeah, someone with the keys let me in. And the principal got more concerned about the keys than my petty theft. And they let me go. But I lied. I lied. And I got through this little, little thing. And we all sometimes... Lie. Maybe not as dramatic as mine in high school, but we all have these little half-truths or these exaggerations or we don't always tell the truth. And it reminds me that, that this, this principle or this truth that we don't always have it together. That at times we all fail. We, we all fall short. At times we lie. And the question I'd like us to consider is not do we lie, but how do we respond to the lies that we tell and the lies that we believe? And that's why I'm so grateful for this story found in Genesis chapter 12. We're going to continue our series in the story. We're in chapter 12 and 13. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn there. The words will also be on the screen. But in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, there's a story about two men struggling with lies. Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. And he was about to enter Egypt and he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. Sounds like a compliment, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like he's going doing a great thing. Here. I know what a beautiful woman you are. But when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Say you are my sister. Come on, Abe. I mean, you're better than that. I mean, just a few verses ago, God gave you a promise of land, and a family, and a future, and so many blessings that you'll be a blessing to the world. And now, just a few verses later, you're lying. Now, some commentators try to get Abram off the hook by saying, well, technically she's the half-sister, so this might not be technically a lie, but the evidence is clear. I mean, Abram put his wife in danger to protect himself. Now where I come from, we would call that guy a chump. He's a punk. Some might say he's a chad. But, but that's where this guy is. But there's more to Abram's life than meets the eye. There's more to Abram's lie than meets the eye. Do you remember the promise? You talked about it last week. This is what we read, go from your country, your people, and your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord told him. He set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. God said, go to the land of Canaan. He never said, go down to Egypt. He said, go to the land of Canaan, and when you get there, Abram, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a family. You're going to have so many blessings. You're going to be a blessing to the world. But Abram didn't stay in the land. His circumstances changed. He got hungry. And he went down to Egypt to live. 
And he didn't believe that God would care for him. And his disobedience led him to lying. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep, cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men. And they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. And in verse 2, chapter 13, we read, Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. And at first glance, we might conclude, it worked. I mean, his lie worked. Maybe even better than Abram expected. He not only saved his own skin, he acquired sheep, cattle, goats, silver, gold, camels, and he got his wife back. Leaving us as the readers to conclude Maybe at times, if the circumstances permit themselves, that it's okay to lie. Anyone remember this guy? Lance Armstrong. You might remember, he didn't just win one, two, three, but seven Tour de France bike races. Some of his sponsors were... Nike and Trek and the U.S. Postal Service and Oakley and Motorola. I mean, he was a multi-millionaire. And he was also a cancer survivor. He started that Live Strong Foundation that touched millions of people's lives. To many people, Lance was a hero. Year after year, he continued to win. Race after race. And people wondered, is this guy cheating? People wondered, as he overcame cancer, as he continued to win, race after race, is he taking performance-enhancing drugs? And Lance, of course, said, no. He told his sponsors, I'm not. He told the media, no. He told his family, I'm clean, under oath. Lance Armstrong lied. He claimed that he never took performance enhancing drugs and he thought his lie was okay i mean look at all of his success look at all the wealth that he was gaining look at where he was going externally until one day lance noticed his 12 year old son standing up for him defending him at school telling everyone my dad's not a liar My dad's not a cheater. My dad's a champion. And days later, Lance broke down. And then days after that, he appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show because he realized inside that what he was doing was wrong. We don't exactly know what happened to Abram. We we don't know if someone confronted him or if the Holy Spirit convicted him. But although he had external success... Inside, Abram knew what I'm doing is wrong. Verse 3, from the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There, Abram called on the name of the Lord. Did you notice what Abram did? In response to the lies that he spoke, Abram did two things. He returned to the place where he last trusted God. He traveled back to the place where his tent had been earlier, where he first built an altar. 
Have you ever noticed how physical spaces can trigger emotional memories? Like when you go to your parents' house or your grandparents' house and you're in this spot and you all of a sudden you remember this about your family or about your childhood or about your parents or grandparents or you go to a church building and you remember your baptism or your wedding or some other spiritual mile marker on your journey that physical spaces can trigger emotional memories. And that's what happened to Abram. Abram traced his footsteps back to the place where he first experienced God's presence in his life. Specifically, he goes back to the altar. And the altar are just stones arranged in such a way where we worship God. And this first altar that Abram created was probably the altar to remember God's promises. It's the place where he arranged the rocks to, to, to remember God's call on his life, where he could pour out in thanksgiving to God's presence in his life. And that's what Abram does when he returns. He retraces his step back to the place where he last trusted God. He goes back to the altar, and the scriptures say that he called on the name of the Lord. He cried out to God. Literally, he repented for his sins. Now, I went to seminary just outside Chicago, but I lived in Chicago in my late 20s, and I played in a, in an, a, a men's hockey league. Uh, and, and it's kind of like a beer league where you get together and you, you play different games uh, throughout the week. And I lived near the goalie, so he and I would drive at times to a hockey game together. And one day after the game, I'm driving home with the goalie, and he says, hey, Chad, i got to tell you something, and I don't know how to say it. I says, oh, just, just tell me. And he said, well, I just had an affair. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I was like, what? I, I mean, it was the last thing I thought he was going to say. I was like, what happened? What, what's going on? Or what? what? And he, he, he went on to share a few things, and I, I was quickly consoling him. I said, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. You, you're, going to be, you're going to be fine. And, and I said, hey, why don't, why don't you and your wife come to visit me and my wife up at our apartment, maybe 7 o'clock tonight, and we can talk it through. So he said yes. But in between the time when, he, when I dropped him off and when he came to my apartment in Chicago at 7 o'clock, I, I was reading the scriptures, and I was thinking about where my friend was at in his journey. And, 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 and one of the scriptures that I read was that godly sorrow produces repentance. And I looked at my friend, I was reflecting on my friend, and it felt like he was in a fog. Like he wasn't really sorry for his sin, like he didn't really know the consequences of his actions. So when he and his wife came to my apartment that evening, uh, they walked up to our apartment, and we greeted each other, and I said, hey, why don't you, um, why don't your wife just hang out with my wife and then you and I just go for a little walk. And so it was, I remember it was kind of drizzling that evening in Chicago and we, we went for a walk. And I, I started just thinking about, you know, how godly sorrow produces repentance and, and he's in a fog. And I said, hey, you know, you know I, I just got this sense that you don't really know what you did was wrong. Like you don't really know how your actions affected your wife and your marriage and your vows. That, that you're not aware of the consequences of your actions. And I took him by the collar and I threw him up against a brick wall and I says you cheated against your wife you lied against God you're a sinner and I said I don't want to see your face until you come back and you know what you did was wrong now, since then I've learned better counseling skills <laughs> but that's what my friend needed he needed someone to confront him to say, what you're doing is wrong. Wake up. Wake up to the reality of how your sin is separating you from God, separating you from your wife. You've not com stayed committed to your vow. And that's what happened to Abram. He woke up. What he was doing was wrong. He lied. He, there's consequences for that. He put his wife in danger. He, he sinned against God, he sinned against his wife, and he woke up and he retraced his steps back to the place where he first connected with God. And he went to the altar, 
And he repented. But there's more to the story. Verse 5. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together. For their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herders and Lot's herders. Now Lot, remember, was Abram's nephew. And back in the day, wealth was not counted by money. It was counted by cattle. The more cattle you had, the more wealthy you were. And Lot and Abram had so much cattle, they had so much wealth, they started thinking, hey, this land ain't big enough for the two of us. We both can't get richer staying here together. So Abram said to Lot, verse 8, let's not have quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we're close relatives. Is not the whole land before you? Hey, let's part company. If you go to the left, I go to the right. You go to the right, I go to the left. Check this out, verse 10. Lot looked around, and he saw the whole plain of the Jordan toward the Zoar was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan, set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan. While Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. At first glance, we might conclude that Lot made an excellent choice. He saw the land, it was fertile, it had water, it was perfect for cattle to graze and reproduce and create more wealth. I mean, business is business. This is just a great business decision. Now, don't get me wrong. I love business. God created us to enjoy wealth. He, want, he commanded us to rule and subdue the earth, to take the raw materials and make them better. But on a second look, we got to notice this phrase. The garden of the Lord. That's what it says in the Scriptures. And commentators suggest that this is more than just a nice place for cattle to graze. That the garden of the Lord, for those of you that know the scriptures, is the garden of Eden. Where there's shalom, peace with God, peace with each other, peace with the earth, peace with yourself. See, Lot concluded, if I just get that land. If, if I could just build my house on that piece of property, if I just get a little more wealth, then I'll be okay. Then I have found my spot. I will have found my paradise, and I will be content. Lot didn't tell a lie. Lot believed a lie. He believed that more wealth equals more happiness. And he was willing to move outside the promised land to get away from his his close relative, his uncle, in order to gain more wealth. See, Lot ran after wealth instead of walking with God. And it doesn't have to be wealth, friends. And you know it's true. Any, Any good thing that becomes the ultimate thing can become an idol. If you place your marriage... As the center of your life. You place your children, your career. Any good thing that you place as the ultimate thing, you begin to worship. It's the place that is your center. And and it's a place that you can drift away from God. A a, a real close friend of mine ended up going to prison for for a crime. and, And before he left, we had conversations about how he got to where he's at. He said, Chad... I don't have a center. So I tried to put my wife there. It didn't work. I tried to put my children there. They didn't fit. I tried to put my career there. It was a disaster. I, didn't have, I don't have a center. I, I don't have a place that I can center in on that will, that, that, that will fill me. See, Lot was putting something at the center of his life that didn't fit. And it cost him everything. And for those of you that know Lot's story or don't know Lot's story, you can read it in Genesis, but it doesn't end well. It gets a little salty. <laughs> but the Lord spoke 
to Abram. Verse 14, look around you. Look around from where you are, the north and the south, to the east and the west. All the land that you see, I'll give to you and to your offspring forever. He's reminding him of the promise. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. And God reminds Abram of his calling. He reinstates him as the father of the faith. He promises Abram the land, a son, generations will live forever and be blessed, and the world will be blessed through him. Now make no mistake about it. Abram failed miserably. He lied. He disobeyed. He gave up on his wife. He gave up on God. But Abram did one thing that Lot failed to do. He repented. He retraced his steps back to the place where he last trusted God. And his lie reminds us of this truth. That our failures do not disqualify us from following God. In fact, rightly responding to our failures qualifies us for service. Because we all fail. We all fall short. We're all in need of God's amazing grace. Instead of continuing down the path like Lot, we can make a choice. Each one of us in our own space and place can make a choice to retrace our steps back to the place where we last trusted God. And when we get there, we can build an altar. Verse 18, so Abram went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he pitched his tents, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Can you imagine if we did this? Like individually and collectively. If we built an altar, how our lives might be different. If we actually took God at his word. If we actually confessed our sins, repented for our mistakes. I mean, if we could really go to an altar and pour our hearts out to God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've lied. I have not loved you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. I don't even know who my neighbor is. God, would you forgive me? I need you. I have walked away from you. Please have mercy on me. Can you imagine the difference that would make in your relationship with God and with your family and the world? And what I find noteworthy is this, is that Lot could have chosen to stay with Abram. He already had a good relationship with his uncle. He already had great wealth. He didn't need more money. He had a budding faith. He was blessed by the covering of his uncle. But he didn't. He didn't choose To obey God and stay in the land. He didn't return to the place. He didn't build an altar. He didn't. And he left. He chose to leave the promised land. Now after my friend walked out of, uh, walked by himself in the rain in Chicago, he kept walking for a while. Came back quite, quite some time later. And Walked up the stairs, walked into the apartment, dropped to his knees, and and repented to his wife. And apologized for what he did. And And he came clean. And he knew what he did was wrong. And many years later, in fact, to this day, my friend would say, that's the day that changed my life. That's the day when I became honest with my relationship with God and my relationship with my wife. That, that's the day that I was made whole. It was an altar experience. It, it was this place where I know what I did was wrong. I repent before God and before my family and those that love you. Can you imagine if that's the kind of life that we live? Like if we were really that honest, that open? In the big ways and the small ways? That we just admit I'm a mess, I need help, please forgive me for my unforgiveness, heal my broken heart. That's what God loves to do. God loves to forgive us, to cleanse us, and to make us whole. And as the band comes up, I I just want to 
lead us in a time of worship. Because there's something about a song and the way that we sing it that connects us to God. There's something about a song and the way that we sing it that, that draws us into his presence. Amen. It's been said that worship opens the door for God's healing in your life. That when you lift up your voices, when you stand on your feet, when you declare that God is good, that he is faithful, that he forgives, he cleanses, he makes you whole. So today, we want to give you that opportunity. We're going to have the, 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 the worship band here, and then the prayer, prayer folks are going to be at the front. And the prayer people would love to pray for you. If you, if you have, but if you don't even want prayer, you can just come to the altar. You can just come forward in your own way, in your own space, and just, just take some of the hard things of your life, some of those difficult things. Maybe it's a financial thing, or maybe it's a relational thing, or maybe it's this internal thing. It's this internal thing, that you, this sin that you just can't seem to shake. Take one of those hard things, two of those, and arrange it in such a way that you build this altar that leads you to worship. And, and you, you get right and real with your God. So, so that's the invitation. to to take what we have seen and heard and learned from the life of Abram and Lot and apply it to our lives today. So God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this space. We thank you for this time where we can experience your grace. And we know, Holy Spirit, that only you can convict sin. Only you can transform life. So we welcome you here. We know that you're here, you're always with us, but we ask that you would manifest your presence even now in our minds, in our hearts, to convict us, to change us, to transform us, to make us whole. And so Lord, as we come to the altar, as we take the hard things of our lives and arrange them in such a way to worship you, we ask that you would inhabit the praises of your people that you would come and minister to us through our time of prayer and through our time of worship. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I heard it broken within Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling To the end of self, to thirst for a drink from the well, Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with. Precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was born So oh, what a Savior, oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, bow down before.
before him bow down before him for he is lord of all sing hallelujah christ is risen let's declare that oh what a savior shine upon you and give you peace. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. Blessings to you.